Good evening. John Walsh has brought almost a thousand of America's most wanted to justice. Yet the crime that is closest to his heart, the abduction and murder of his young son Adam, remains unsolved. Leads were lost or simply never followed up. What answers could still be out there? Tonight, Primetime shows you what investigators may have missed. One theory in particular, and it points to one of the country's most notorious killers. In a dark back alley of a Florida mall, an ordinary door. But what might have happened behind this door some 26 years ago? Could this room hold a tantalizing clue to a crime that's haunted America for decades? It was a crime that changed how we search for missing children and changed forever the life of this man. This is America's Most Wanted. Today, John Walsh is the famous force behind America's Most Wanted. Well, now it's time to do some business. But back on July 28, 1981, he was a father scared to death about his little boy. A very bright child, but very shy and rather introverted. He's of a slim build and would just appreciate anything, anything that anyone could uh, give us any information on him. The morning before, his six-and-a-half-year-old son, Adam, had been abducted from a mall in Hollywood, Florida, taken from a Sears, his mother, Reve, just an aisle or two away. The Walsh's focused media attention, which led to a landslide of tips and calls. But the police, without the benefit of Amber Alerts and modern tracking systems, were overwhelmed. Joe Matthews has worked the case and remembers what it was like. Leads are coming in and, and nobody's looking at them and people are throwing them away. And I, I saw one on a napkin, I saw one here, I said, you know, there's no organization. Isn't it almost impossible to say that there weren't opportunities that might have been missed early on because it was back then in 1981? Absolutely. Captain Mark Smith is the current keeper of the unsolved file on Adam Walsh. I have to venture to say this, that changed everything as far as how police respond. But back in 1981, important leads may have been lost. During those first few days, two witnesses say they had come forward with compelling accounts. But in the chaos of the search, their stories were never followed up. Willis Morgan said he was in the mall that day when a disheveled blonde man approached him. He smiled at me and said, hi there, nice day, isn't it? And Politely, like trying to make conversation? Yes, but he was, he was completely disheveled. And um, I didn't want to start a conversation, so I didn't say anything to him. Morgan says the man became incensed. He had this like look of rage. Like, he was staring at me really intently. I'm thinking, okay, something's going to happen. I'm thinking, does this guy have a knife? He says the man suddenly strode away, and fearing he might attack someone else, he followed him into Sears. Just as I looked, I saw him turning into the toy department. The toy department, the last place Adam was ever seen. That same morning, a second witness, Bill Bowen, says he was just about to enter the mall when he saw a disturbing scene unfolding next to a blue van. I saw that there was this man, and he was turned around to me, and it had a little boy by the arm up in the air, like a sack of potatoes. Off and the ground? Off the ground. And a little kid was screaming, I'm not going, I don't want to go. And this guy was just, I can't describe the rage in his body, even though I was behind him, he was just, just shaking. And he said something to the effect of, yes, you are. He just screamed it, it was almost uh, like a howl. And he literally took the kid and just swung him like a pendulum swing and swung him and threw him into the driver's side of the van. And then he jumped in and the van just sped off, tired screeching. Both men say they reported what they'd seen but heard nothing further. I don't doubt they did what they said they did, but uh, we were just, as from, from an agency standpoint at that time, it was rather overwhelming. Two weeks later, an anguished John and Reve Walsh appeared on Good Morning America, their hope visibly fading. What happened last night? Can you tell us what? They have found the remains of a, of a young person in Florida that at this time they are trying to identify Later that day, John Walsh learned the grisly truth. The remains belonged to his son, Adam. All that was ever found 
his decapitated head. The police continued to investigate, but eyewitnesses Bowen and Morgan were never contacted again, their first-hand accounts apparently forgotten. Flash forward 10 years to 1991. Both witnesses living in different cities 600 miles apart open the newspaper. Inside, a photo of a serial killer just arrested in Wisconsin. Bill Bowen and Willis Morgan react instantaneously. This is the guy, this is the guy I saw in the mall. And I went, oh my gosh. This is the guy that was there. And it was him, it was Jeffrey Dahmer. Could one of the most infamous crimes in America, the murder of Adam Walsh, be the work of one of America's most infamous criminals? Two forgotten witnesses say it could. It was Jeffrey Dahmer. Why are you so sure? Because I was face to face with him, like you and I are. You believe Willis, you think he saw Dahmer that day? Absolutely. No question. But we probably would never have known about witnesses Bowen and Morgan if it weren't for a true crime writer named Arthur J. Harris. When the Walsh police file became public in 1995, Harris did something apparently no other journalist in America thought to do. He read it, all 7,000 pages, and thus began a 12-year private investigation that he admits has become a kind of obsession. What's the chance that you're a little too close to this? Show me where I'm wrong. You believe you know who killed Adam Walsh? I believe I do. It was Jeffrey Dahmer. Back in 1991, grisly images from Wisconsin were searing themselves onto television screens. The worst mass murder in Wisconsin history. At least 13 human heads found in a West Side home. And now they are searching for even more victims. Within minutes of seeing Jeffrey Dahmer's picture in the newspaper, witnesses Morgan and Bowen both called the Florida police. But in Wisconsin, according to former FBI agent Neil Pertell, the Dahmer investigation had already made the Adam Walsh connection. One of the detectives was going through the timeline. He mentioned Miami, Florida. And I remember looking up and looking at another detective across the room who was looking back at me, and he mouthed Adam. And we both looked at each other and we shook our heads and said, could this be? The Wisconsin team learned Dahmer arrived in Florida in 1981 after serving in the army in Germany. Dahmer was mostly sleeping on the beach and had found a job at a sub shop only minutes from the Hollywood Mall. And he was already a killer. Three years earlier in Ohio, Dahmer picked up a hitchhiker named Stephen Hicks took him back to his parents' place and decapitated him in the crawl space under the house. Back in Wisconsin, Agent Pertell called Florida police that first day. I said, there, you've got to look at this because this guy is, uh, is someone who was living in your area and he's, he had already killed prior to coming into your area. But could Dahmer really have done it? There were arguments on both sides. Dahmer's known victims were mostly young men, but certainly not as young as Adam. Dahmer was on supervision for molesting a young child. No, he didn't kill that young child, but he did kill the young child later. Another reason to dismiss Dahmer, someone else had already confessed to the crime. In 1983, drifter Otis Toole said he did it, but then recanted. That Adam Wolf case isn't uh, a true. What is it? I didn't, I didn't do that case. By 1991, he had confessed and recanted yet again. And although several people had come forward claiming to have seen him in the mall, police still couldn't prove Tool had even been in the area. So in 1992, a Florida detective was sent to Wisconsin to ask Dahmer if he killed Adam. Dahmer denied it. I heard it on the news, but I had nothing to do with it, no. And if you did have something to do with it, you would, you would admit to it. Uh, right. Yeah. But the bottom line says, if I killed Adam Walsh, I would tell you. I got no reason not to tell you. The denial didn't ring true to Agent Pertell. He says, honest to God, Neil. I, uh, I said, Jeffrey, let's leave God out of this conversation. He said, oh, he laughed a little bit and said, I didn't, uh, honest to God, I didn't, I didn't do it. 
It was then that Dahmer added the words that still haunt Pertell. He said, you know, Neil, anyone who killed Adam Walsh could not live in any prison ever. Pertell believes it was code for what Dahmer couldn't tell him directly. If he admitted to the crime, he'd be killed in prison as a pedophile. That's a pretty close to an admission. You asked earlier, why would someone keep secrets? Why would someone not ex uh, say everything that they've done? There's always secrets. After the searing judgment of one of his victim's relatives, a stone-faced Dahmer was sentenced to life in prison. Back in Florida, Harris was on the trail of the blue van. Witnesses say they saw at the mall that day. But if Dahmer was driving it, where did he get it? Harris traced eight employees of the sub shop where Dahmer worked, who all agreed it had a delivery van. It was definitely a blue van. Darlene Hill, once a co-owner of Sunshine Subs and its sister restaurant, said employees borrowed the blue van all the time. If you worked there or, or what you knew where the keys were, you could take them. And then Harris made a new discovery, a report police had never found and one that led primetime to an abandoned room. Inside, a provocative discovery. It's pasta. That is positive for blood. You have a positive for blood in the corner of this meter room right next to where Jeffrey Dahmer worked. That's correct. What does it all mean when primetime continues? John Walsh took up parents' concerns for all children's safety. John Walsh has kept his son's memory alive through his work. But despite helping so many families on America's Most Wanted... For my family, there's been no justice. When Art Harris published his theory, Walsh at first seemed intrigued. I think that they have to look at this case. But then issued a statement saying the police had told him the Dahmer connection was totally unsubstantiated. But if that's true, then why were authorities quietly interviewing Harris's witnesses? Primetime's cameras caught an investigator from the state attorney's office interviewing Darlene Hill shortly before we did. And I guess the, his major concern was uh, the blue van and how I knew about the blue van. You're on record as having said to John Walsh, you don't see any, any real value in, in what he's put together. Why do you believe that? But as far as what Art Harris has put together? Yeah. Well, I don't, I don't know if I should have said I don't see any value in it, because, again, cannot exclude Jeffrey Dahmer. We can't, we can't say he didn't do it. Much more difficult is to prove that he did. If you're going to kill someone, where are you going to do it? At the time Dahmer was living mostly on the beach, where could he have taken a victim? Hi, I'm here for records, please. And then, just two months ago, Harris found a police report that provided a possible location. It was filed just 20 days before Adam was abducted. In it, Jeffrey Dahmer reported finding a dead body. The body was found behind the sub shop where Dahmer worked, just outside a deserted meter room. A cursory autopsy revealed the man, a derelict who'd been sleeping in that meter room, died of natural causes. Captain Mark Smith of the Hollywood Police Department had never seen this report until we showed it to him. It had been hiding in plain sight for 26 years. The idea that Dahmer's on record with the police talking about something just days before Adam Walsh disappears, how does it strike you? It's interesting. I mean, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, you know, ironic. And then there's the now vacant meter room. A long shot to be sure. Still, Primetime hired a Florida licensed crime scene investigator. And late one night in May, with the owner's permission, we went into that room. What we're basically doing now is trying to um, find things to test for blood. It seemed mostly untouched by time. The landlord said there'd been a fire at the mall in 1994, but no obvious signs of it here. Labels on the meters were written in fountain pen, and part of one wall had been replastered. Hard to tell when. Do you see a pattern? She says, here, put on these colored goggles. We're all looking at it. 
and what lights up is this pattern, this classic pattern of spatter. The CSI's alternate light source played across what she said looked like blood spatter in a corner of the room, more than 100 dried droplets. In the same corner, she discovered a sledgehammer and an ax. Finally, the CSI is ready to perform a presumptive test for blood. If we're dealing with blood, we should have a color reaction immediately, and the color reaction oh, would be magenta. It's positive. That's positive. That is positive for blood. You have a positive for blood in the corner of this meter room, basically right next to where Jeffrey Dahmer worked. That's correct. I'm thinking this is maybe where it happened. This may be the exact room. It was, it was unthinkable. Lab tests done later determined the samples were simply too degraded by time to be able to distinguish if the blood was human or to get traceable DNA. The room remains only a tantalizing possibility, awaiting perhaps more advanced testing by the police. But Joe Matthews says he has the answer right now. He says the room is just a room. Matthews is one of the original Florida cops who worked on the Adam Walsh abduction and is now an employee of America's Most Wanted. Matthews, to put it plainly, is not buying the Dahmer theory. What if? That's your whole theory. What if this? What if that? Matthews and other doubters point out that Dahmer claimed he didn't kill for nine years between the hitchhiker in Ohio in 1978 and the Wisconsin murder spree that began in 1987. The question is, do we know there really weren't any earlier victims, victims Dahmer never admitted to? He would come back with blood all over him. Billy Capshaw says maybe there were. He was Jeffrey Dahmer's army roommate in Germany in 1980, an experience he says he barely survived. The look in his face is something that if you've seen it, if you've ever seen it, you'll never forget it. What was that look? Death and not a sound. If you got attacked by Jeff Dahmer, you didn't get a sound. He didn't even grunt. Capshaw was beaten and raped and received full disability for what the Army later admitted was his torture at the hands of his roommate. And Capshaw says he might not have been the only victim. Sometimes Dahmer would go out at night and come back the next morning, his shirt soaked in blood. And I think that's when he probably committed some of the murders over there. Indeed, the German officers and detectives came to Milwaukee to question Dahmer about certain uh, disappearances. Dr. George Palermo, a psychiatrist who examined Dahmer for trial, says he always believed there were more victims. I firmly believe that, that Dahmer did not have a 10-year free period from criminal activity of such a type. Former cop Joe Matthews is still putting his money on someone else. What do you think happened to Adam Walsh? I think Adam was abducted and murdered by Otis Toole. Matthews says Toole is the guilty party, even though he recanted his confession. He points to other eyewitnesses who put Toole in the mall in 1981 and says he has proof. I'm putting together a presentation. And then I think at that time, you'll have your smoking gun. The one thing that's for sure is that everyone involved, no matter what theory, no matter what side, they all want to see this case solved. It was a crime not only against a child and a family, but it was against a community as well. And people were scared. We were all scared. And all parties agree that only more investigation of all leads and suspects can ever put this story to rest. I, I think any time doubts raised, you have to you just owe it to, your, to the investigation to resolve it because that's, that's what you do. That's what the word investigator means, you know, because you just never know. Tool 
and Dahmer both died in prison, taking their secrets to the grave. And to the best of our knowledge, Hollywood police still have not tested that room. John Walsh agreed to an interview, but later sent us Joe Matthews instead. Understandably, this is a painful subject for Mr. Walsh and his entire family. Joe Matthews says he will prove Otis Toole is the killer on America's Most Wanted this fall. We'll be right back.